halfway through the book of Acts, but don't worry, we're not going, this, this sermon series is not going to go, we're not just halfway through the summer sermon series. We're almost done. We've got two more messages after this in the book of Acts. And you may wonder, well, why is it that we've spent so much time in the first half? and not the second half. And we will touch some points in the second half, but the way the book is written, things kind of build to the tension point of the mid middle section, Acts chapter 15. And then after Acts 15, then it continues with a lot of missionary journeys, visiting different places, visiting different churches, and we'll hit some points along that. But it's kind of like everything builds up to chapter 15, and then goes forth from there. So 15 is the is where everything kind of hits a boiling point. You know, I shared with you uh, in past weeks that there was controversy, but it was just under the surface. You're not going to read about it yet until you get to chapter 15. Uh, the church was scattered, so the apostles and the followers of Jesus were sharing the good news with non-Jews, people of different kinds, and they would respond and they would receive the Holy Spirit and rather than having the men circumcised and having them follow the law, they just baptize them and say you're good. And so this was controversial. It started with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It continued with Peter and Cornelius and probably many others that we don't read about. And then Paul. Last time we left Paul in our series, he was converted to the faith. You know, he had that blinding light. He was knocked off to the ground and then his sight was restored and he gave his life to Jesus. And after that, Paul would preach in the synagogues. He visited the Jerusalem church, which is kind of like the main headquarters at that time. And then he went on a missionary journey with his friend Barnabas, going to different places and establishing churches. He would go on a number of missionary journeys in his lifetime. But at this point in chapter 15, he'd been on one of those missionary journeys. Meanwhile, the controversy continues because Paul is arguing, and he's not the only one, but he's arguing not just that, he's not saying that the law was once the way of salvation. He was saying that the law was never the way of salvation. He was saying that the law was never essential to the faith. That is what was so controversial. In his letters, he teaches, that he, and he goes back all the way to Abraham in the Genesis. And he says that Abraham believed in God, and that Abraham was considered righteous because he believed in God. So even Abraham, Paul says, was justified by faith, that he had faith in God before there was even a Jewish law. And he talks about what the role is that the law had, but it was very different than what the Old Testament taught. It was very different than what people knew and what they grew up learning. And so you can understand why this would be so controversial. It's like, it's like for so many centuries, the law was kind of like the foundation of the faith. And Paul just kind of, Paul just kind of scooches it over here and says it has a part, but... Really what matters is, is faith in Jesus. And here's the law which helped us out and kind of hindered us in some ways. But here's Jesus. So you can see why that would be so controversial. And so people would come down to these churches that Paul started and they would say, Ah, uh, folks, you have to be circumcised and you have to follow the law of Moses. And so there was uh, much debate. And so Paul and Barnabas and some others, they went to the Jerusalem church, the headquarters. We could call it kind of like the conference center. And so they went to the, the Jerusalem church where the apostles were, the elders, the leaders of the church. And so they're greeted warmly by the church, and they share their stories. They share their stories about how the Holy Spirit came on these non-Jewish people. And so who were we to say that they couldn't be baptized? And so they hear these testimonies, and then, then some Pharisees stand up and say, well, these people need to be circumcised, and they need to follow the law of Moses. Now, we, we tend to like to stereotype Pharisees, and we like to say that, that they were all bad, and that they all rejected Jesus, but that's not true. There were many Pharisees who believed in Jesus, who believed he was the Messiah, and they became followers of Jesus. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee. 
But it's just that the Pharisees, they were always big on following the law. And these Pharisees remained passionate about the law, whereas Paul did not. So they stand up and say, well, you have to be circumcised and follow the law. I mean, it's all well and good that these people are coming in, but, but they need to follow the same faith tradition that we have followed. And so the scripture, I love how it says that it says there was much discussion. <laughs> There was much debate. There's a lot that's not said there. And so we don't know. We don't know how long this discussion was. We don't know if this was going on for uh, hours or how long this was. Uh, if you've ever been in a church meeting that's going on for hours, and uh, you might wonder, when is this going to end? Uh, if people had watches. Maybe they would have been looking. I don't know. But there was tension in the room for sure. As there were people who believed both things, and they all had valid arguments based on Scripture. And so, excuse me, Peter gets up and he shares his testimony, and he says, I don't think that we should burden these non-Jewish people with the law, when the foundation of our faith is faith in God, and has been all along. More discussion. <laughs> More discussion. Then... James, the brother of Jesus, gets up and he shares. Now, you know, when you think about who knows Jesus best, you'd think it'd be the apostles, James, the brother of Jesus, people who knew him. And yet the interesting thing in this meeting is that, you know, Jesus talked about the law. But even people who knew Jesus could not agree on what the role of the law was here. Now let me ask you something. If people who knew Jesus could not agree and come to consensus on what Jesus meant, what hope is there for us 2,000 years removed from Jesus in coming and all being of the same mind in agreement on everything? Pretty impossible, right? So anyway, they are meeting and they can't figure out what the role of the law is. They have these different viewpoints. James gets up and says, you know what, folks? I think that what Peter, what Paul, what Barnabas are saying is the way to go. It agrees with the prophets, and he quotes from Amos chapter 9. Now, if you look at Amos chapter 9, it talks about uh, when the Israelites were in exile in another country. And Amos is saying that God has not forgotten these people up here in Babylon. He's going to bring them back to Israel, and they are going to be great again. And not only that, but many nations that do not belong are also going to come, and they are going to be the people of God. And so they see in here a prophecy that non-Jewish people are going to start following the God of Israel. But Amos says nothing about the Jewish law. He says nothing about the role of the law. So as far as this actual debate is concerned, it, it has nothing to do with it. But nonetheless, what James is doing is he's looking at that scripture and he's saying that he thinks that what we are doing now, what they were doing then, is in the spirit of what Amos is talking about back then. Does that make any sense? They felt that they were in the same spirit, the same momentum, the same trajectory of what Amos was talking about. Now, so what they did is they decided that they would send a letter to these non-Jewish churches. And they would explain that we're not going to make you follow the Jewish law. We basically want you to refrain from four things. A lot of them have to do with meat. <laughs> Number one, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Number two, don't eat meat that's been strangled. Number three, don't eat meat that has blood in it. Okay? It's enough to make us just be vegetarian and be safe. So, you know, all these three things have to do with meat. And then the fourth thing is to refrain from sexual immorality. So, meat, 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 and then sexual immorality. You know, kind of interesting. But a lot of these things have to do with how Jews and non-Jews could get along with one another in their different ways. Later on, Paul would argue that actually it doesn't matter if you eat meat sacrificed to idols. But for the sake of peace between these two groups, we need to be careful about how we this. And the interesting thing, the letter that they send to the churches, the way they, they say it, is it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And then they said what they decided on. Now, why do I share with you the minutes from this church meeting? You know, reading minutes from a church meeting, 
Maybe not the most exciting thing you've ever heard in your life. But the reason why I share this is because I think that there's something profound here. Number one, at no point in this meeting does God just come down and magically tell them what to do. God does not tell them what to do. Instead, they have to figure it out themselves using holy conferencing, talking to one another, discussing, debating. It doesn't mention prayer, but we can assume that there was prayer involved as well. Uh, they listen to the experience of the different people who saw the Holy Spirit upon the non-Jewish people. And then they looked at Scripture. But interestingly enough, they didn't look at Scripture the way we would think. Because if they really wanted to use Scripture as the foundation for what they decided to do, their conclusion would have been that everybody, the men needed to be circumcised and people should follow the law. Because you can find a myriad amount of Scriptures in the Old Testament that clearly teach that the law should be followed for all time. There is no expiration date on circumcision. There is no expiration date on these dietary laws in the Jewish law. And so if they wanted to go with the Bible says, it, I believe that that settles an approach, then, then there's plenty to draw from in the well of Scripture. They could have gotten done plenty of Scripture that would say, this law is forever. That's what the Pharisee believers were doing. They stood up and they believed that. And yet, they chose, because we believe they knew their Scriptures, they chose to ignore them, or at least to de-emphasize those Scriptures. And instead, they chose to focus on scriptures that kind of sort of talked about what they were talking about instead of the scriptures that directly talked about what they were talking about. And so they choose Amos, the prophets, and, and, and they say that this is in the spirit of what we are doing in this new situation. They felt, for whatever reason, that what the scriptures clearly taught about the Jewish law, for some reason, were not applicable to this current situation that they were in. And so the interesting thing, maybe we would even say disturbing thing, is the fact that this very momentous decision, this decision that ultimately resulted in the creation of the Christian faith, this decision that led to the worldwide religion of the Christian faith, was based not on scripture, but on experience. The experience. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Really? So the Holy Spirit, they're referring to the experience of the apostles and, and, and Paul in which they saw the Holy Spirit come on these people. Really? So that's going to be the foundation of your argument. And you can hear the counterpoints. You know, you can hear the opponents. You can hear the people who disagree with them. Really? So that's going to be the way we can do this now. We're going to just throw out circumcision. We're going to just throw out all these dietary laws. And a lot of basically the foundational parts of our Jewish law based on a few people's experience of what they say the Holy Spirit did, based on what seems good to them, isn't this kind of a slippery slope? I mean, what's going to be next? If we give up the, the Jewish law, what's going to be next? But Paul, Barnabas, Philip, Peter, James, and many others decided that this was a slippery slope they wanted to ride. They were willing to ride it and to see what came next. And you know what it turns out came next? The abolition of slavery. Uh, the belief that women are made in the image of God rather than property. Uh, a lot of things came next. They weren't necessarily bad. But you can understand where both sides were coming from. They all had valid arguments. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, uh, used four things to help discern the will of God. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. We know what Scripture is. Tradition has to do with what people have thought before. Reason has to do with what makes sense. Experience has to do with how we experience the world around us. And so people would use these four things, but sometimes one would trump another depending on the situation. And so that's why sometimes people can use the Wesleyan quadrilateral, that's what we call it, it's a cool name. But they can use those four things and come up with different conclusions on the same issue. And the question is, how do we know what is right? Because let me tell you, this issue was not concluded at the end of this meeting. 
<laughs> How could it be? It was so doggone controversial and so doggone radical. How could it be concluded? It wasn't. As people continue to argue, and it, would, it will come to a head again, as we'll see in the last sermon in this series, which will eventually lead to Paul's death. So it kept coming up. But the interesting thing is that they used their experience and decided God was doing a new thing. And they saw a continuity with their scriptures. Now, if we find that disturbing, that, that's, that makes sense. I mean, many of us, including myself, grew up reading and viewing the Bible in a very different way from the way that Jesus and the apostles and many of the first followers of Jesus viewed the Bible. Meaning, you know, I grew up believing that every single word was directly the word of God coming from God directly to us, unmitig unmitigated by culture or experience or worldview. And so, you know, you kind of, I kind of viewed the Bible as an encyclopedia that you could look anywhere and you could look up. You could find the answers for any and every situation in life. You could look in the Bible and you could see God's direct work for you on any given subject. And that it was a flat book. It was unchanging. Instead of being a developing story where people learn more and more about God, it was like an index that you could look up of, uh, and you could find anything you needed to find. Just like an encyclopedia or a dictionary. But that's not the way Jesus understood the Bible. It's not the way the apostles understood the Bible. Jesus had no problem saying that certain scriptures in the Old Testament that were said to be from God were actually from human beings. He had no trouble changing the meaning of Old Testament scripture for a new context. The apostles are doing the same thing in this meeting as they chose to de-emphasize some scriptures and emphasize other scriptures. And so if that's disturbing to us, it's because we may not be used to that idea. But the fact is, they had to reinvent the faith for a new context. And if they had not done that, there would be no Christian faith. Because it wouldn't have gotten past the first century. Do you know what finally ended the debate on all this? The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's what it took. When Rome came and ransacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple and everything, the debate was ended. Why? Because most of the Jews who happened to believe that the law still needed to be followed were killed. And of course, many of those, by that point, the Christian faith had become mostly a Gentile faith, a non-Jewish faith. And so those that, that uh, were more Gentile, well, they lived outside of Jerusalem. And so it's sad that it took that to end that debate. But, you see, Paul, Barnabas, Peter, they interpreted the scriptures that they believed that they were being faithful with the scriptures in what they were doing, even though, yes, they could point to some scriptures that say the exact opposite of what they're doing. Now, if that's not complicated, I don't know what it is. But, so, what does this have to teach us as a 21st century church? Well, as a 21st century church, first of all, we need to realize, as I was saying, that just as they had to kind of rethink their faith, reinvent their faith, this is something that the church has been doing throughout church history, whether we realize it or not. If there is any church in the world today that believes that they are just continuing on the faith exactly as it has been handed down to them from the first century church, they are kidding themselves. Because the 21st century church has very little of anything to do in common with the 1st century church. And that's a good thing, folks. That's actually a good thing. Because the, what works it worked in the world back then is not necessarily going to work in the world today. And so I don't think that the church should look the same as it did in the 1st century or in the 15th century or even in the 19th century. You know, I think that we continue to look at what does it mean to follow Jesus in our current context. And the problem is, the disturbing thing is, God doesn't just come down and give us a magical answer, just as he didn't do that um, in the first century with their meeting. Instead, we have to figure it out through thoughtful prayer, through thoughtful scripture reading, through conversation and conferencing with other people. 
through listening and, and watching how the Holy Spirit works in different kinds of people. But there's no clear-cut answer. Boy, I wish that God would just come down and say, do this. Thanks, God. That was wonderful. Thank you. And, or if we could, you know, view the Bible as an encyclopedia, a guidebook for life, and I can just look and find the answer to any and every given situation in my life. Now, it's not that the Bible doesn't give us answers to life. There is much wisdom to be found in the Bible, and we can open the pages of the Bible and find much wisdom and teaching for many different principles in life. But I think oftentimes what we do is we place expectations on the text that it was never meant to handle. That, that the text is not meant to teach us, to tell us the answers to every single thing that we might ever face. A lot of things, yes. But much as they found in the first century, even though the Bible spoke about the law and the role of the law, they realized they had to do some thinking for themselves to see what that meant for them in their context. And we, the church in the 21st century, we have to do the same thing. Even though the Bible says, maybe speaks on certain subjects, we have to ask, okay, now what does this mean in our current context? And how do we live that out? It would be easier if we didn't have to do that. If the Bible would just give us clear-cut answers to everything. Because then we wouldn't have to come up with our own solutions. Then we could just outsource our thinking to a book, and then we wouldn't have to worry, and we wouldn't have to think. But the thing is, God expects us to continue to work out and figure out what it means to follow Jesus in our generation, in our context. God expects us to work together and to figure out what that is. And yes, that does mean that we won't always agree on it. And you know, when that happens, when all of this is happening, you know what? We have something in common with the first century church. <laughs> because the same was true for them, as we see in Acts chapter 15. The same is true for them. And so, the answer though is, how do we navigate this uncertain world? See, I think sometimes when we place those expectations on the Bible, that the Bible is supposed to give us absolute certainty on everything, we almost make certainty an idol. But I think that there's a difference between certainty and faith. In fact, there's a big difference between certainty and faith. When we have faith, we believe where we have not seen and so I think the questions we ask is how, what do we do, uh, how do we know what is negotiable in the faith and what is essential, how do we know whether we're hearing the Holy Spirit or something else, how do we know if we should trust what we feel or what we think or what we're reading or how we're interpreting the scripture, these are all questions that are hard to answer. But as we seek to continue to study reflectively, to pray reverently, and as we seek to follow and listen for the Holy Spirit, may God grant us grace, not just in our individual lives, but as a church and as a denomination. May God grant us grace that we may continually seek the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then we, be, we may be open to what God may be saying to us, whatever that may be. Amen.